In the book of Hosea, God is speaking and he says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. When Israel was a child, I loved him. It says, and I called him. It says, it was I who taught Israel to walk. Yeah, if I has a pet name for Israel called Ephraim, it was I who taught him to walk. He says, and I took him by the arms and I healed him. And I led him with cords of kindness and bands of love. It was I, it was I who taught him. He said, and I eased the yoke from his head. And then I bent down and I fed him. It's a picture, the Bible is painting for us a picture of a God who is so loving, who is so gentle, who is so caring, who is so kind. He says, I'm the one who, I knew Israel, I'm the one who taught him to walk from when he was young till now. You know, we've been in this series entitled Sent. I've been, it's been an evangelistic series, we've been talking about reaching out. And really wanting people to recognize and understand there's only a level of blessing that you get if ever, all you ever ask of God is to, I want to receive from you. There's a whole different level of blessing that sadly not enough Christians enter into. And it's not just about receiving, it's about giving. The Apostle Paul actually says, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And it's not just about giving of money, it's giving of time, giving of your heart, giving of all that the Lord has done in your life. You ought to now reach out and give to other people. The call to evangelize is a very particular and personal call to you. That is, for me as a pastor, I actually don't count my preaching up here as evangelistic in that sense. There is still a call on my life to one-on-one, one-on-one, -on -one, one -on -one, wherever I am, to people that I meet, to reach out with the gospel. As it is for me, it is for everyone who names the name of the Lord. Now, the Bible will say to us, and I'm just summarizing some of the parts of the series now, that evangelism is a mandatory call. It is not an optional choice. It is a mandatory call on each person. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever reached out with the gospel? Have you ever shared the gospel? Have you ever won a soul for the Lord? Where the Bible says that he that wins a soul is wise. But you can do it. And I want to encourage you, go back through the series and some of the practical helps that have been given. Because as you go out in evangelism, you will see that it takes friendliness. Be friendly. It takes willingness to do what the Lord has said. And it takes, above all, obedience. When he says in Matthew chapter 28, when he says, go out into the whole, the whole world making disciples. And then they, but we've learned about our approach as well. That in approaching it, we need to go with, first of all, with our stories, often a very good way. With your own story, what the Lord has done for you. Go now back home and tell of all the good things God has done for you. That's, that's a big part of it. Go with your own story. Sometimes the long version, the short version, the medium-sized version. The appropriate version that fits the moment. To go first of all with your story. But then off the back of your story, at some point in that friendship, let the gospel come. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of which I was the former spouse. Of which I too was a sinner. But then he saved and he forgives and he helps. And he removes guilt and shame. And he sets life on a better path. This is the gospel that everybody needs to know. Well, if the story is the first end and the gospel is the next bit, there's one final component I want to put in today, and it has to do with your kindness. If you are going to be an effective evangelist, kindness really does matter. Because, you see, kindness is the front edge of evangelism. Yeah, if ever you see some of these huge drills that they have, I'm told that the front tip of those drills is actually made of diamonds. Because diamond is so strong and it's impregnable, so it can help burrow through whatever concrete they have to smash through. Kindness is just like that. It's the tip. It's the front edge of evangelism. It is the penetrating point of evangelism. It is the entrance into the heart of people. Even a hard heart, kindness has a way of burrowing through and opening a door. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus actually showed us this. When the Bible says, and so he sent them out. Think about that. Jesus, from the very beginning, he sent them out two by two. And he said to them, go. 
Now go into everywhere where I'm sending you. He said, and I'm sending you as lambs amongst wolves. So he knows what this is. He knows you find it tricky. You're supposed to find it tricky, but then you're supposed to overcome it. He still sent them. And he said, now go. And when you're going, don't take any money, no knapsack, you know, no bed or sleeping, no sandals, you know, no idle chatting the whole way. He's basically giving them a sense of urgency and focus. This is a pretty important thing for you to do. And it's with that in mind that I want to talk to you this morning about the importance of kindness. The importance of kindness. My own, perhaps my key experience of kindness in my own life that I remember, you know, there have been many of them, but one key one, when I was a teenager, something 14, 15, somewhere there, and uh, in our home we had... Um, uh, a, one of, we had a car, a VW Beetle, praise the Lord, a VW Beetle. And uh, these cars were, you know, it, it, my mom had one, but then this other one was there and uh, kind of like a, a run around, it was all bashed up, but it worked. And, uh, and as a young teenager, every so often, you know, you know, when you're a boy, you just want to, you want to drive something. And you, you want to, you, it's just, boys are made that way, okay? So, so those of you that have sons who you scare, he keeps running around, pastor. He's supposed to run around. He's a boy. He's supposed to have it inside him, okay? Boys want to run. They want to shoot something, kick something, and drive something. Well, I was no different. And so it is that every so often when nobody's at home, I would go downstairs to this car, put the key in, and just start it. Vroom. I mean, just the sense of power that entered me. And then, and then you, would, you would go for, you got to go for it. Even louder. And, and, and with each, with each uh, acceleration and the increase of decibels, some, you, you feel you're doing something worthwhile, praise the Lord. Doing something worthwhile. You know? And, but you know, this thing doesn't stop there. After a while, these thoughts began to enter my mind. What would it look like? You know where this is going. Yeah, yeah. What would it look like to actually drive this thing on the road? I mean, I've been watching them. This is the easiest. How hard can it be? Yeah, how hard can it be? So one day when nobody's around, got the key, when they're, you know, that helped. Took the car, I'll get up, just began to drive on the road. Now, the first bit was a little tricky because I just didn't understand in the world what biting point was to get there. But it's a manual car, you know. And so the way I knew to get the biting point, you just do the accel, vroom, then you let the clutch off, and for some reason it would jump forward. And, and if I'm lucky, it will stay on, and then you go. And I did it went out on the road. I, of course, I'd also learned that real men, they don't, just dri they don't drive with two hands. One here and the other here. In the name of the Lord, I was doing it. <laughs> real men, real men, this is how they drive. I've seen them like that. So I was go going, going, everything. <laughs> My hand couldn't quite, couldn't quite reach it. Somehow, I ended up in a very busy part. This is in Nigeria. This is Lagos. Okay, now you need to know about driving in Lagos, okay? You have to be strong, you have to be angry, you have to be aggressive, and slightly on cocaine for this thing to really work. <laughs> to really know what, because everybody on the road, they know what they're doing. You can't turn up doing your fancy little... But I, it's one of these moments almost that you take a turn in and you just go. Because when you're driving like I am, first time, you don't want to stop. Because now you have to do the whole biting point thing. So you go there, any road that looks open, you just go. <laughs> and so I ended up, I still remember the area in Nigeria. Oh, there's a bridge on top of it, and it's a kind of major bus stop area, okay? And this is in Lagos. And, I'm, and, and in, at the bus stop area, everything slows down. The buses, this is busy. Nigeria has 200 million people. To put it in perspective, the UK has something like 60 million, okay? So 200 million people is a lot of people. And on this day, it looked like they were all at the bus stop. <laughs> and so I had to stop. And you, you stop, and these buses, they, 
They know what they're doing. All the other cars, everybody is shouting, the bustles, everything. And now the car stopped and the car wouldn't start again. Yeah. Suddenly you go from being a very cool guy with the hand, you become a small boy very close to tears. And then you pray. Even though you don't believe in the Lord, you pray. You do whatever it is you know how to do. Apart from wetting yourself, you do everything. Well, I stride and try. The car just would. You know, when fear comes in, even things that you know how to do, you suddenly do not know how to do. And the whole, now people are coming and shouting, move off the car. And eventually, this thing kind of, it wouldn't start. It would, eventually, it kind of started. As it started, I was just glad. As I went to get the biting point, I moved forward into the car in front. I have suffered in life. <laughs> I have suffered in life. Like, this is just not my day. Never mind, I shouldn't have taken the car. I mean, this is a problem. Now, the, that one comes out and the, everybody, now I'm the focus. I, I am in trouble. And everyone is shouting, you cannot, and you just, I just sat frozen. Frozen. And it was in that moment that this woman came with her voice lifted and shouting. And she said, no, 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 it wasn't his fault. It wasn't his fault. So I saw the whole thing. Everything is fine. He will be fine. Leave him alone. And, and then she looked at me and said, go on, start it, start it, go. And then she would shout at these people and look at me and go, 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 go. And she did all this. She, honestly, she went in front of all these angry people with her incredible wiles and ability. She defended me. She was the buffer zone. And somehow, by the grace of God, the car, I started it again, managed to maneuver it, ran for my life as she waved for me, to me. Oh, there are kind people in this world. There's no reason why that woman should have stopped. She wasn't driving. It wasn't like she was a driver and knew what to do. She was, there's no reason why she should have. Maybe one day I'll get to meet her. I will be on my knees thanking her, you saved my soul. I've never driven since. <laughs> yes, I have. Oh, she was a good Samaritan. There are many qualities to kindness. You might want to write some of these things down. The first one is generosity. The willingness just to bless other people. To bless other people. To use your own strength to cover up other people's weaknesses without pointing out their weaknesses. To bless other people. It has to do with goodness. The willingness just to serve. Just to do what is right because it's right. To do what nobody else will do. Even if people don't deserve it. To just serve other people. With the resources that you have. It has to do with gentleness. The willingness to empathize. And to be sensitive towards other people. To in a sense enter into their own world. And understand and empathize. Even when it's their own jolly fault. For the situation in which they're in. To learn to empathize. And then when it comes to the sources of kindness. Well first of all. A key one is just humanity. That built into you is the ability to be kind. I know we're all born sinners and in sin, but even as sinners, we can still do acts of kindness. We really can. There are lots of people who are not Christian, who don't have any brief for God, and are incredibly kind people. It's a very human trait. And we shouldn't be so surprised, because we're all made in God's image and his likeness. In his image, and we are like him, in his likeness. In other words, the residue of his goodness is inside us, inside every human being. It has to, it has, Jesus Christ, on one occasion, he actually said this. He said, he said you know what? You, if you being evil, Matthew 7, I think 11. If you being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, then how much more your heavenly father. Think about that line. If you, being evil, you still know how to do good things. So in your hum humanity, there is kindness. There is a capacity for kindness. And then not just that, in, in communities. Many communities find out eventually, if we just do wickedness to each other, everyone ends up dead. And so in the end, they build, they build boundaries to enforce kindness into, into every community. There are things that are against the law, and there are things that you are encouraged to do because it makes goodness happen. 
In fact, in the book, in the, in, the, in the book of Corinthians, Paul actually says this to the Christian community about one particular issue. He says, we have no other custom and nor do the churches of God. He said, this is how we are. In another place, the Bible says the traditions that have been given to you, continue them. In other words, in every community, there are certain key values that keep the boundaries there. Humanity, community, and then the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. You want to write that down. That the source of kindness also comes from the Holy Spirit. In fact, it begins with God because the Bible tells us that God is kind. In numerous places that God is kind, depending on how they have rendered the word. In, you know, what we have is not the Bible. What you have is a translation of the Bible. And so sometimes the words uh, are rendered differently. But the number of times the Bible refers to God as kind and kindness, gracious, merciful, and kind to all generations. So God is kind. He has kind. Not just that. Jesus came to demonstrate kindness to the woman by the well, to different people that he met, to those who were sinners and had been cast out and cast away. It was those people that he actually went to. And then the Bible gives to you and I by the Holy Spirit that has been shed abroad in our heart. He puts the Holy Spirit inside of us. And the fruit of the Spirit then begins to grow inside of us. Where in Galatians chapter 5, the Bible says, that now the fruit of the Spirit is this, that you may know what is inside of you as a child of God. It is love. It is joy. It is peace. It is patience. In the latter side, it says it is goodness. It is faithfulness. It is gentleness. It is self-control. Nine of them, four on one side, four on the other side, and bang in the middle, kindness. That you have the capacity to be kind. And there's never a reason not to be kind as a child of God. Even in difficult times, even when you feel somebody deserves something harsh, there's still always a reason to be kind. So if you have kindness inside of you, then the Bible says, then express it. It says, as chosen people of God, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, chosen people of God, it says, put on kindness. Let, let it be the first thing that people say, put it on, put on kindness. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Let kindness be like a chain around your neck, just like something I'm wearing here. Let it be the first thing they, they see. Let it be around your neck, not around your ankles. So that is the first thing they see. First thing they see. If eventually, they, if it's not around your neck, but it's on your ankles, which means people see the kindness eventually. It's too long. It's too late. It's not upfront enough. If your life is such that when they say, is he a kind person? They say, well, I don't... The answer is, it's looking like a no. It's looking sadly like a no. In your workplace, I'm not talking about diligence. I'm not talking about commitment. I'm not talking about getting you to work on time. Talking about, would they say you're kind? If the answer is, uh, okay, I wouldn't say that. Maybe you would then say, oh, no, they just don't know me. Oh, friend, maybe they do. It's not until you're wicked before you say a person is unkind. It's just people who are neutral. Neutral. They never show, move forward, reach out with kindness. The Bible says we should be those people. Put on kindness. You, should, you have it on the inside. Now really put it on. And then in Ephesians chapter 3, it says be sure to express it. It says be kind to one another. And then it shows you what that looks like. Forgiving one another. And be tender-hearted. Even as God in Christ forgave you. If God has been kind to you, he says you should be kind to other people. To one another, those of the household of God and beyond. And beyond. The different qualities, the sources, and then the expressions of kindness. Okay? Where you have kindness that is planned. Planned kindness where you have random acts of kindness. And then there are times that two people come together and they, have, they work together for a common purpose, joint acts of kindness. Now, if you're used to Jubilee, you know how the sermons go on the length. You're probably thinking, whoa, pastor, calm down. We're practically finished. Some of you are thinking you want a refund. <laughs> well, the reason I went through that fairly quickly it's because I wanted to do this a little bit differently today. I want a couple of people to come help me uh, with this sermon. So the first person I'm going to, so the chairs are going to come out. 
real super smooth. For what it's worth, this, uh, whoever needs to know about this, this monitor in front here is uh, playing up. So if somebody needs to know that, I'll let you know. Okay, great. Well, the first person that's going to come help me today, her name is Catherine Pass, married to one of the leaders. Jubilee, please welcome Catherine. Okay, Catherine. Ah, may I have a hand here? Oh, is that, is that working? Oh, you can all hear me. Okay, great. So, Catherine, good to have you here. Thank you for coming. And um, so you are Catherine. You have uh, two children. Two girls, yeah. And you are married to Pastor Dave. Yes, Pastor Dave. And we all have our problems, don't we? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you just knew I had to say yeah. something. Right? Yeah. You know, there are just some things you just have to say. It's right there. Okay. Well, um, great to have you here. I, I was thinking in the first service, I really wish I'd brought a photograph of all the pastors together and our wives, because we do that quite a bit. We meet together quite a lot. And uh, I've always felt that Catherine is the kindest of all of us. It's very kind. Yeah. <laughs> Catherine, yeah, she's the kindest, you know. Uh, Catherine will meet with people in the church. She will bring them close. She will text people. She will do all these wonderful things. And then you'd never know, because she's so quiet, You'd never, the rest of us were going in the name of the Lord. Who have you, who have you texted lately, Pastor? Zero. Not good. But Catherine is the one, so she always puts us to share. So, Catherine, is it true? Is this rumor true? Are you kind? I would like to think I'm kind, but God is working in me every day to make me a kinder person. It's not me, it's, it's God in me. Oh. <laughs> Even she gives right answers, <laughs> just piling the guilt on more and more and more. <laughs> Right, you know, I mean, I think the way the Lord taught her kindness is because she's married to Pastor Dave, and you need a lot of... No, I'm okay. saying nothing. <laughs> you see how kind she is? I'm trying to get her to sin. She won't respond anyway. So, well, let me say this. Um, um, when it comes to the whole thing about kindness, how would you describe it or define it? Well, my favorite definition of kindness is that kindness is a supernaturally generous, reorientation of your heart towards other people, even when they don't deserve it, they're not going to give you anything in return, because this is how God himself has loved us. Okay, so that's a pretty good and comprehensive uh, description, definitely. I mean, can you go through it, just break it down for yeah, us a little Yeah, there's a lot bit. in that description. So when I say true kindness, I mean Christian kindness, that's from the Bible, that's what God teaches in the Bible, that's what I mean by true kindness. And when I'm saying a supernaturally generous reorientation of our heart, what I'm talking about is the Holy Spirit working in your heart daily to change it from one way to another way. So we're changing your heart from looking to yourself to looking to other people. And that's what the Holy Spirit is doing. And God is working in you every day if you invite him in to do that. So we're talking about other people. So we're talking about when I say that they don't deserve it, we're not judging anybody because none of us deserve God's love. So we should give out the love of the people without, without judging them. And we should also not expect anything in return because we don't deserve anything. Mm -hmm. We should just do it for the love of God because yeah. this is exactly how God has loved us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, and so in there, what is kindness? Is it an emotion? Is it, how would you mm. describe it? I mean, kindness starts with an emotion, but it always ends with an action. Because just an emotion of kindness doesn't really do anyone any good. If you think, oh, I really feel for that person, they're really hungry, but you don't do anything, that doesn't really help them. It's yeah. by going and doing something, that's where the real kindness comes in. Yeah. And, and are all Christians kind? Um, I believe all Christians can be kind. It's the fruit of the Spirit in us. You're so kind. Look how she <laughs> says it. I but believe I they can be. <laughs> but, you know, we all have days when we're kinder than others, I believe. There's days when we are more uh, blessed with kindness than others. So, yeah. <laughs> Let me ask the people to tell me the truth. <laughs> uh, exactly, you know. Are all Christians kind? No. Are you kind? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah you see, <laughs> we, o <laughs> we always keep the best case scenario for ourselves <laughs> and the worst case scenario for other people. But uh, I have met one or two Christians who have been slightly less than mm. kind. And they did it in the name of the Lord, they say. <laughs> and because uh, you, you, you work with the uh, children's uh, you know, department, the you've seen pre stars. parents come. The parents uh, are wonderful in this church, I have to say. 
And they have lovely children as well, I have to say. Especially the three and four. Just <laughs> well, you can see why Catherine is going to heaven. I think that... <laughs> I think they're a little doubtful on my part. Okay. Well, um, um, so all Christians, uh, so not all, but everybody, everybody's growing. Okay. And, and, and what would you say uh, in your own, your own life on a daily basis? What does kindness look like? Are we talking about people going to the ends of the earth, you know, going to, I don't know where, some part of India somewhere to, you know, save the giraffes? Well, I think some people will be called to go and save the giraffes. Someone probably here really cares for giraffes. So, you know, someone will be called to do that. Um, some people will be called to work in prisons, to work with refugees, to work with street children. But not all of us are going to be called to do a work, say, like Mother Teresa in Calcutta. Not all of us are going to do that. A lot of us are going to be here in Enfield, in Ponders End, in Wood Green, in Ilford. We're going to be here just living our lives as Christians. So there's things that we can do every single day. We can start now. We can... Be kind to people. Maybe when you're doing a shopping, you can let someone go in front of you in the queue. You know, it's that, that's giving someone a little gift of time. You know, that, yeah. that, uh -huh. that will be, a, a lot of people will just benefit from that. You could offer to buy someone a coffee when you're in Costa. You can be polite to the Costa barista when you're buying your coffee. Just be nice to them, be gentle to people. Make someone stay better. Give something, take some of the pain out of their day and give them something back instead. Yeah, yeah. I remember what you were talking when you said, you know, you're on the queue and you see the person that you can tell is harassed mm -hmm. in a hurry or something, maybe a mom with three children and so on, and, and just saying, let them, let them go forward. That's, you, you, I found it funny, I just remembered we, you, when we were talking, you mentioned about somebody in the church, you said was so kind, Dean. What was oh, it yeah, he did? Dean. Um, well, I had a picture of Dean. So, so Dean well, is was, a, somebody um, who is in Jubilee Church in the Enfield Church. So Dean okay. is, is, is an amazing guy. He's, he's just a kind, lovely guy. But we were in prayer meeting once, and I was feeling tired. And I wasn't, you know, you're, I was rushed. I was late to prayer meeting. I was having to leave early. I was, oh. And I was just praying. And I had a picture of Dean standing in front of me. I had a picture of him. He, Dean's job is that he drives around the city of London doing driving jobs. And I just felt God saying to me, you know, if you were ever in trouble, Dean would, would help you. In fact, Dean, he's on the street. You know, he, he would help anyone that he saw. He's just a kind guy. And I just saw a picture of him like seeing a situation like so maybe someone was in trouble on the street or maybe mugged and he would stop. I thought this guy would stop and help them. And I just felt so hard. I thought, my goodness, there's so many Christians. And then I looked up in the room at prayer meeting and I saw all the different people. And I thought, each one of these people, I don't know these people. I can't, it's dark, I can't see who they are. Each one of these people is in their workplace and they're spreading kindness and love. And I don't even know they're doing it. And I, just, I was really uplifted by this thought that actually People that I don't know in this church, in other churches, are yeah. out doing God's good work. Yeah, yeah, it's a wonderful thing. And, and if a person was like, you know what, well, I need to grow in this, mm. you know, how would you advise them? Mm. Where, where should they start? So yeah, if, when I want to be a kind of person, the first thing I would do is pray. So when you come to pray as you do every day, when you're saying thank, thanking God for your salvation, ask for more kindness, ask that he give you a heart for other people. <sighs> A heart that is less selfish, a heart that is just wanting good for other people, and ask that you would see other people through his eyes and the way he loves them and the way he sees them. So, first of all, you've prayed. Then God's going to start to make you aware of things. You're going to start to see things. Maybe not the first day you may go out and suddenly realize you get back, well, I haven't done anything today. A week later, you suddenly start to realize, okay, I can actually help. Oh, my neighbor, she could do a hand, put her bins in, or I can help this co worker. You'll start to see things that you can do. And the third step is the hardest step. This is, we're, we're going to need courage. We need to step out in courage. This is the one that I find hardest. I'm not a very courageous person. I'm not very bold. So I need a lot of help with this. So I need to pray. But this is where God is really looking to us to see, okay, are you, are you actually going to do something? Are you just going to have a good feeling? Or are you going to help that person? Are you going to put yourself out? Are you going to put someone else before you? Or are all your good intentions going to come to nothing? I'm just going to sit there because we can make excuses every day. Yeah. 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 And last of all, we're just going to leave it to God. We're going to leave it up to him because at the end of the day, it's all up to him what happens. So we're going to, first of all, we're going to pray. We're going to, become aware of our situation, we're going to step out on courage, but then we're going to leave it with God. Yeah, yeah. You know, and turn, do what you can, leave the rest to God. And it takes time. Mm, Some of these time, things yeah, take time, yeah. you know, to... Uh, to. And, 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 and as a church, are there things that we do that mm. are acts of kindness? I mean, Jubilee does so many things already, that probably things I don't even know about. 
But um, we already have an amazing food bank run by the wonderful Kerry Kerr, who is a very, very kind, lovely lady, <laughs> as you know. So food bank, and from food bank at Christmas, we give out hampers at Christmas services to people from food bank. There is a meal on Christmas Day for anyone who'd be alone. Um, and this year, just um, we've just at a very last minute thing we're going to do. This is very low level kindness, but just spread out a bit of kindness in Enfield Town. On Saturday, um, next Saturday the 7th, I've got a little bit of space from the Enfield Town Shopping Centre and we're going to wrap people's presents. If they bought a present that day, they can come up to us. We're going to wrap the present, we give them a mince pie, just give them a little bit of kindness because the shops can be unpleasant at this uh -huh, time, you know? Yeah. So that's what we're going to do just for two hours. So if anyone's interested in doing that, it's not a hard sell evangelism, it's just low level. And then we might give them a leaflet about yeah, church. About the church yeah. yeah. Like we said there, it's not a hard sell mm. deal, it's a low level. Mm. I, I remember you talking about one situation where a person was initially doing a hard sell and then they thought... Yeah, there was a working. guy I was reading about, he was... Um, he was a new Christian and he was on fire for God. He wanted to win the world. You know, you have that fire in you. Mm -hmm. But he was going about it. He was just telling everyone they were sinners. He needed to repent. He was abashing them with the Bible. He suddenly realized in six months, he'd give his mum a call. She'd be like, yeah, yeah, I'm busy. Like, I don't want to see you. Suddenly he realized his family didn't want to see him. His friends didn't want to see him. He's like, wait a minute, this isn't working. I'm actually telling people off this thing. So he changed his tack. He decided, okay, do you know what? Um, he went to the park and he was giving out like ice lollies. It was in America and it was nice and hot. So he was giving out ice lollies to people, just random people. And some people wouldn't take them. Some people would take them. Some people would just take them and walk off. Mm. But then like, you know, two of every 20 maybe would stop and go, oh, so why are you giving me this ice lolly? Are you trying to sell me something? He said, no, I'm giving this to you because I want to spread some of God's love today. He's loved me a lot. I want to love you back. Some people would be like, that's nice. Some people would then have a deep conversation. He may end up praying with somebody. Um, and he suddenly realized, actually, I've had more success in one afternoon mm -hmm. giving away 20, 50 ice lollies than I have six months of hard sell, you're a sinner, yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I think you're right. I think, I think this is really helpful, the different levels, the mm -hmm. personal, and they just have to go through life to learn to be, learn to be mm -hmm. kind. I, I found that, um, and I know that in the life of the church and all the Jubilee churches, that there are people who just are doing, they come together sometimes and are doing different things. And they, all of them are acts of kindness. And one of them is somebody that I wanted to bring up because uh, she's kind of involved in feeding uh, homeless people and has just done an incredible work. Her name is Bassie Williams. Jubilee, please, would you help me welcome Bassie? <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bassi. Uh, good to have you here. Okay, and uh, uh, very nice trousers, I see. <laughs> <laughs> and very shiny, very shiny top, I see. And uh, are you a pop star, <laughs> Bassi? <laughs> well, um, Bassi, good to have you here. And uh, I, I, so I know that you do quite a, a good work with the homeless, and it's not just you, you and a number of friends. Uh, how, how did it start? Um, thank you for that. It started with a deep friendship within Jubilee Church. Um, few women coming together, we've been doing life together, uh, birthdays, um, celebration of our birthdays, children's birthday, Christmas right. together. And then in um, 2017, uh, there was a sermon on going out and sharing kindness and helping others. So we were challenged on that issue. So we started thinking about how to do something towards the Christmas of 2017. Uh, that's, I, I really like the way the whole thing started because you were friends, people who met each other in the church. Yeah. And uh, what was it that connected you? So I, I'm guessing it's the season of life, women of certain season of life. Yes. And, uh, and then you came together, you're blessed, you heard the ser a sermon on helping. So having known how to serve each other, you wanted to serve beyond. So yeah. now this would have taken a bit of planning and so on. And how did you go about that and Def what to do? Definitely. We assemble in my house and we have uh, uh, meetings upon meetings and targets, few charities we can help. And with this, we had intention of having resources from ourselves to do that. And also we included planning for what kind of gifts we should be giving to people right. uh, if we find a charity. So from there, um, we looked into various uh, charities, as earlier mentioned, 
And we came up with um, Eunice, one of our girls, and I want to mention all the girls' names, uh, Corina, Fana, uh, Fiona, and we have Ruby, Aida, as well as Eunice. Eunice is now serving in Gambia. So we all came together and decided to do that. It was tricky because some of the charity had, do have their obstacles. We couldn't penetrate certain things. So Eunice then linked us with the Rashida. She's a sister in the church, so she works with Christian Kitchen. So that's uh -huh. how we came to. And her. so you came to Christian Kitchen. That's wonderful. I, I have a photograph of some of the um, ladies there. So from the left, I think that is Fiona Wilmore. Yeah, Corina, uh -huh. Ida, Fana, Ruby. There's yeah. Rashida in the middle there. And we have Eunice, myself, and Bethlehem. And Bethlehem. It's just so wonderful. And then there's another photograph, I think. Uh, of, um, That's in the Christian Kitchen van when we are serving. Right, that okay. Was a winter month. Yeah. Is there one more after that? Okay, yeah. so that's the outside just, of the van. Yeah, outside of the van. Right. So tell us a bit about Christian Kitchen. Christian Kitchen is um, the char a Christian charity that has been established for um, numbers of years, about 25 years now. And they are saved, um, they have 22 churches involved with it, and they have 200 volunteers. And they save uh, every day of the year, 40 to 75 people are mm. fed every day. So it's involved cooking and planning the meal, hot meal every day. We have uh, three square meals, starter, <laughs> main meals, and then desserts. So we do all those ones. And, and, and you guys, are, so, you, so when you guys are on, you are... Cook, you guys are on three times uh, in the month, in a two month, Mondays yeah. and a Saturday. Yes. Um, and so the cooking of the food, do you, does somebody else do that? Or are you guys doing that when you're um, cooking? Sometimes they do have cooked, but they don't have any longer because they don't have financial help. So right. we do the cooking ourselves. So mm -hmm. for starting from preparation to prepping the van, that means we put the food in the van, drive the van down to the uh, you water You drive the van stage. also? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so four well, of us do drive the van, but they, as I said, Eunice is now in Gambia serving the lot. So yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. This is one. I, there are a couple of shots that um, there's one where I think we can just see Beth. Can you go back one step? Uh, there's a photograph I think that was before that. Uh, okay. That's one go, of the go, Yeah. Okay. Go forward. Uh, you can see on the outside in the car park there where people have come and they're lining up yeah, and they're homeless yeah. and you feel that's the van. So you kind of, you're in the van, you open the door there. What's the next photograph like? And then that's Bethlehem, I think. Mm -hmm. And that's some that of the food so there hard, yeah. and serving the people. And the next one. And so you, I, I see tables and chairs and so you actually, people yeah, get to see. Yeah, comes from the van, yeah. So, so how do you allocate it? Some of you do the cooking, some of you do yeah, the... Yeah, we serve and because we call it Jubilee Crew. So, oh, that's now yeah. the girls or the ladies. <laughs> well done. So we, since we all started from Jubilee, so um, we pick up. Sometimes it's four or five of us that can mm -hmm. be present, depending on the seasons of life. Some may be maybe involved at uh -huh. you know meetings at jobs, so they couldn't come on time. Mm -hmm. So anyone can do anything, and then it gives us opportunity also to share and pray for mm -hmm. those uh, homeless people yeah. or people who came up. Such mm -hmm. such such good work. And how is it funded? Uh, how do it's you self uh, well self contribution few individuals also contribute and few charity or the organization give but we really need some help in terms of mm -hmm. finance because the bus needs to be the van needs to be it repairs and we could do it having maybe part time person someone to cook the food because sometimes we come from work by the time we get in there it's getting late so we are all rush rush to Wow, so sometimes yeah, you started. go from work straight and down straight there down there to, to, to do there. this. And, uh, and mm. I'm just so impressed about these women. Some of them are single moms and so on, but they're still putting themselves out to serve people with all the constraints of life. And I think we should just applaud all these women for the incredible work that they do. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And so I see some of the needs obviously is financial and to, uh, uh, to be able to bless. Committed volunteers. Yeah, but then I think volunteers. volunteers We've got a table upstairs for mm -hmm. people to sign in if they want to do, even if it's once a month. Yeah. Uh, we save the people 365 days a year. So. Wow, that's mm -hmm. incredible. Every single day, yeah. every single day. And I, and I think, you know, in the end, uh, Catherine, what would you say are some of the benefits of being kind? Well, first of all, the first benefit of being kind is, first of all, someone gets something. So 
with Christian Kitchen, someone's getting fed. Yeah. If you're being kind to people, like giving someone gets some extra time if you let them in front of you. So first of all, you're benefiting somebody in some way. They'll leave with that feeling that's, that's given to them. Secondly, you yourself, you will actually benefit in huge ways that there's been medical studies on this, that you will, your depression goes down, blood pressure goes down, your health goes up, pain levels go down. It, I mean, if you, you could look this up, this is non-Christian stuff. They've done this like randomized controlled tri trials that yeah. it will benefit your health in a huge way and your spirituality. But thirdly and most importantly, it is for the glory of God. Yeah. Um, and it opens, the kindness opens a door to evangelism. You might start with the evangelism, then it's a few words, then you might start with a friendship, mm. then you can share your life, then you can invite them to church. But it's all started with as just a, a little step of kindness. Yeah, yeah. And for you, Basil, how has this impacted your own life? Personally, it's humbled me and like a kind of also as a respite when you're going through challenges. So you could actually see the fulfillment. You know, you feel you're giving out to other people, not really focusing all the time on yourself. And as you rightly mentioned, the depression or stress level is yeah. less because you're doing something to yeah. others of saving them and to the glory of God as a whole. Yeah, form. that's wonderful. I, I, yeah, let's applaud the Lord for that. Yeah. It's funny, as you were speaking just now, I was thinking of Jesus on the cross and the people nailing him to the cross, and he says, forgive them, Father. And even in that last moment, still has an act of kindness, words of kindness towards other people. We feel, I feel so proud as a pastor that people like you guys are in the church. And I know there's so many, many others. Jubilee Church, please really help me thank Catherine Past and Bassie Williams.
I really do. From the first time I saw that advert a few years ago, I just loved it so, so much. He won't be famous. He won't be known. Nobody would even recognize it. But he did what was right, and he showed love. But then in return, he feels love, and he feels good emotions. I've seen people whose emotions have basically been dried up because of the hardness of life, but not him. It's a beautiful advert. Reminds you so much of the verse in Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? He's told you what is good. He told you what you should do. What does God require of you? To do justice. There are those who cannot fight for themselves that you can fight for. You can write a letter about. You can help fill a form. You can show kindness. You can love kindness so much that it comes out of you every time and walk humbly with your God. And ultimate kindness, frankly, is shown in the Bible is by God. Ultimate kindness, the highest form is by God. In fact, there's a word in the Bible. Most people know the word agape in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the word is chesef. And it means loving kindness. It's, an, it's acts of kindness that God, almost like he couldn't wait to do, loving kindness. And it's best demonstrated in the story of the prophet Hosea, who God calls the prophet one day and said to him, Hosea, I have a job for you to which he stands ready. What is it, Lord, from Hosea chapter 1? And he says, go out into the streets and find a prostitute. And then what do I do, Lord? He said, then you shall bring her all the way back home. And then what do I do? He says, then you marry her. You marry her. You marry the one that nobody else wants. You marry her. And you will have three children with her. Then what happens? And God says, then she will leave you. And in fact, she will leave you and go back into the streets. Then what do I do then? He says, then you go back into the streets and you find her again and you love her all the way back. And the point of this, Lord, that only when you have learned and seen and experienced this, then you know my own heart towards Israel, my own people who are lost. Then you catch a feel for the heart of God who goes back looking for the sinner, who goes back looking for the offender, that he might love them and bring them back. Or if you were to say to God, okay, I understand that, but to keep going back. Why do you love Israel so much? In Exodus, God said, Israel is my firstborn. In Hosea chapter 11, he says, when Israel was a child, he said, I taught him how to walk. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and I taught him how to walk. He said, it was I who took him by the hands. It was I who took him by the hands and led him with cords of kindness, is what he says, with cords of kindness. And then God says this. He said, oh, Ephraim, and then he turns to Israel. Maybe to you today. You might be far from God. He, God actually turns in this speech that he gives in Hosea, and he says, oh, Ephraim says, my heart recoils within me. My heart recoils with deep within me. And my compassion grows. And my tenderness is just there. There is no other religion in this world. Is why Christianity, frankly, is not a religion. No other religion that would present their God as one seemingly so weak. But it shows the vulnerability of God in wanting to love those who are, as it were, unlovable. Be careful about the person who says they're kind, but they're never moved, they're never sensitive, they never cry. Be careful about a pastor who never cries, who never cares, who is never moved. Because people who are kind, their hearts are tender. It doesn't mean that they're weak. Kindness is not weakness. True Christian kindness, frankly, takes strength and courage and boldness. It takes a lot of boldness to the Jew to become as a Jew. It takes a lot of boldness to the poor to become as the poor and to love people. And to give sometimes from the little you have to break it into and to give to somebody else. This is how we have known God. 
and this is what God expects from you or not. He has shown you, oh man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice. To fight for those who cannot fight for themselves. With your knowledge, with your ability. What good are you doing? He turns to Ephraim and says, how could I let you go? My heart recalls within me. My emotions are so deep. And God, God ends by saying this, I cannot let you go. I never let you go. Why? Because I am God and I am not man. I am God, I am not man. I'm the Holy One. I'm in your midst. And I'm saying all that to you today because maybe there will be some of you here today that maybe you've gone off on a wrong turning. You've gone off in the wrong way. Or life has gone so weird and funny for you. Maybe you've walked away from God and now you, found your, you find yourself in the valleys, in the darkness. This God is saying, I go back for such people. Even the one I've corrected a hundred times, I'll go back again. When I read these stories, I think I see a picture of the kind of husband he wants me to be, father he wants me to be, friend he wants me to be, pastor he wants me to be. It's all there. And nobody will outgive God. He is kind, He is loving, He is gracious. And he's coming for you, for good, not evil. Would you stand up with me, everybody?